Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldy, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldy. Okay, there are, I'm always looking for that red light. <laughs> Good to see everybody, and again, for those of you out in television, we just cannot thank you enough for your letters and your prayers, your, your financial help, and uh, we appreciate the fact that you're keeping them short, and uh, it's just almost amusing, isn't it? We don't mind if you have to say something that's more than a page long. We'll read it. But uh, stands to reason we've got hundreds of letters coming in every day, and we'd like to be able to read them all. But uh, again, we just want to thank you so much. And again, for those of you on television, if you want to order these programs, this is all going to be part of Book 67. And that, of course, means in all the formats, these uh, 12 programs. Okay, we're uh, still on the but nows, but God, but whatever. And uh, we, in our last program, just got started in the next one we want to look at is in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And uh, I'm heading down to verse 23. Haven't gotten there yet. But where he says, but we preach Christ crucified. And, uh, you know, this is the thing that I cannot comprehend, and I still run into it all the time, why people detest Paul and his epistles. And uh, if they don't detest him, they at least ignore him. And why? In fact, we were just talking about it at break time. Why is Christendom so adamantly against Paul's gospel? Because Paul isn't elevating himself. He's lifting up the crucified, resurrected Christ. And I just can't comprehend it. But it's evident. Uh, almost everywhere we go. All right, but now back to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and we might as well just retrace our steps in the closing minute of our last program, down to verse 17, where contrary, of course, to John the Baptist, who was sent to baptize the Jews, the baptism of repentance, now Paul goes on the other side of the coin, and he says, for Christ, see, not some man, not some organization, but Christ himself sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Now, isn't that simple? To preach the gospel. And that's all it takes, because, see, when the gospel takes a hold of people, it transforms lives. All right, so he was sent to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, not as a show-off order, not as a pulpit-pounding preacher, I think Paul just simply laid out the truth in language that anyone could understand. In fact, uh, on R.G. and Cruz, Bill, didn't you appreciate uh, when the fellow dramatized Paul? And uh, I was. I was really impressed with the young man, and uh, he was dressed as Paul probably was dressed. And believe it or not, in one of his dissertations, he quoted almost, not quite, but almost verbatim, all of First and Second Timothy, and it was like a sermon. I mean, I just just soaked it up. Well, same way here. I don't think Paul ranted and raved at people. I don't think he tried to show his intelligence. He didn't try to show people how much more uh, intellectual capacity he had. He just simply got down on the ordinary man's level and preached the gospel. All right, now let's read on. Verse 18, this is why he preached the gospel, for the preaching of the cross, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The preaching of the cross is to them that perish, the lost world, it's a bunch of foolishness, but unto us who are saved, it is the power of of God. And as I mentioned in my closing remarks in the last half hour, the power that it took to save every one of us in this room, the power that it took to save all of you out there on television, it was a power exhibition. How that all of the forces of sin and death and Satan were broken when he brought us into salvation. All right, now let's read on. Verse 19, for it is written, now he goes back to the Old Testament, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, 
I will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Verse 20, where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? Now again, Bill, I'm picking on him because I know he was along on, on the cruise with us. You remember at Mars Hill, Bill, there was only one big bronze plaque, and it wasn't to any of the Athenian philosophers. It wasn't to Archimedes. It wasn't to Homer. It wasn't to any of the others. Who was it? Paul. There's this brass plaque commemorating that it was on this Mars Hill where the Apostle Paul confronted the intellectuals of his day. And whenever you read these verses, that's what you have to understand. All the intellectual bigwigs of Athens came to nothing. They aren't even remembered by the secular world for tourists' sake on Mars Hill. But here's this bronze plaque commemorating the Apostle Paul. And so this is exactly what I think he's referring to. Where are the wise? Verse 20. Where is the scribe, the professional uh, intellectual? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath God not made foolish the wisdom of this world? Now verse 21. For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom, knew not God. Now i got to think of something. Back to Romans. Back to Romans, and I think it's in chapter... Yeah, chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, verse 21 and 22. Now... Don't ever get me wrong. I don't ridicule educated people. That's not the point. The only time I make it a point of ridicule is when they think their education is superior to the Word of God. Yes, then I ridicule it because they don't know what they're doing. And that's what Paul is referring to, how that the philosophers that he confronted on Mars Hill were so arrogant that they looked down on the little apostle who was God's instrument for that day, and what did they call him? A babbler. To me, we'd almost say somebody who wasn't all there. That's how they looked down at him. All right, but now look what the apostle is led to write in Romans chapter 1, 21 and 22. Because that when they knew God, in other words, conscience had made the presence of God known to them, that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were they thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Now look at it. Professing themselves to be wise. They were what? Fools. Fools. Why? Because they're putting the intellectual things of this world above the things of the Creator Himself. And listen, they're just as guilty today as they were in Paul's day, or in the days of the flood, or as far back as you want to go. All right, back to 1 Corinthians again, chapter 1. Verse 21 now. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 21. For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God, because they got puffed up, you know, in their own self-importance. It pleased God by the foolishness, that is, in the eyes of the world, by the foolishness of preaching or proclaiming the gospel to save some, or save them that believe, I'm sorry. So it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that, what? Believe. And again, like I did in the last taping, can you add anything in there? Is there anything else in there? Does it say to them that believe and are baptized? No. Does it say to them that believe and join the church? No. Believe and whatever else you can think of? No, it's not there. And I use the example, plain arithmetic. If you've got a digit number, we'll say five, and you put a plus zero, what's the answer? It's still five. 
That's plain arithmetic. Five plus nothing is five. The gospel plus nothing is still the gospel. And you can't add anything to it. Okay, reading on. Verse 22. For the Jews require a sign. Now think about that a minute. When did signs become a part of the spiritual life of Israel? When? Way down in Egypt. Now think a minute. What kind of signs did God use for the Jews in Egypt? Well, do you remember when Moses came and had to prove that he was God's messenger? What did he do? He threw the rod on the ground, and it became a serpent. He put his hand in his breast, and it became leprous. Put it back in and took it out, and it was perfectly whole. Now, what were those? Those were signs to prove that Moses was God's instrument. All right. They came to the Red Sea. What happened? It opened up by the power of God. What was it? It was a sign to Israel that they were now under the power and the control of the Creator. And so all the way up through Israel's history, it's the revelation of the power of God through miraculous signs and wonders. But it hit a crescendo now. When? when Jesus began his earthly ministry. The very first miracle, what was it? Transforming water into the best wine that they had ever seen, heard, or tasted. For what purpose? Again, just like with Moses, to prove to Israel who he was. And so the Jews were just saturated with that concept You've got to show me a miracle or I can't believe. Well, God did over and over and over. All right, so now Paul is rehearsing that. The Jews require a sign. That's not empty words. It was a fact of life. They did. But now look at the next part of the verse. And the Gentiles or the Greeks, they don't look for miracles. They're all hung up on what? Wisdom philosophy. Now again, I'll take you in your mind back to Paul in Athens. My, it tells you as plain as day, those philosophers gathered up there on Mars Hill overlooking the city of Athens for one purpose. And what was it? To tell anything new that they had heard or seen that would add to their wisdom. That's all they were concerned about. Wisdom. Earthly wisdom. Man's wisdom. All right, so you got the two concepts now. Israel is constantly looking for a sign or a miracle to prove God's existence or his presence. On the other hand, the pagan Gentile was just looking for wisdom. Got the picture? All right, now let's ready to go on. Verse 23. But, Paul says, we don't pay any mind to either one of them. We're not here proclaiming miracles and signs and wonders. We're not here proclaiming our intelligence in the affairs of humanity. We preach Christ crucified. Unto the Jews who are looking for a miracle, it became a what? A stumbling block. A stumbling block. Now you remember the scripture also refers to Christ as the chief cornerstone. And the analogy is that as the builders were building the temple and the cornerstone had came in, or I've got to watch my grammar. i got English professors watching me. And as they saw these stones come in, here came one they didn't know what to do with. So what did they do with it? They cast it aside. Well, the symbolism was that when Christ, who is symbolically the chief cornerstone, when he came, they cast him aside in the same way. They didn't know what to do with him. They cast him aside, and he became then a what? A stumbling stone. Okay, that's all the analogies that's brought in here, see? All right, so Christ crucified to the Jews became a stumbling block or a stumbling stone. They stumbled over who he really was. 
the Jews, or I mean the Greeks, I'm sorry, the Greeks look at the preaching of the cross as a bunch of what? Foolishness. Now you see the two different concepts? The Jews looked at Christ crucified as a stumbling block. Something cast aside for which they didn't know how to use or wear. The Gentile, on the other hand, cast it aside because it was just a bunch of foolishness. It didn't fit their philosophy. Oh, but now I love the next verse. See, here's the frosting on the cake, if I may use that expression. But unto them who are called, that is, into salvation, the believers, whether Jew or Greek, Christ becomes the power of, of God, now that's a reference to the what? To the miracles. Now I got to take this slowly or you miss it. Christ as the power of God was evidenced in Israel's miracles. The greatest one, I think, was the Red Sea. What a miracle that the Red Sea opened up wide enough for the children of Israel to come through in a matter of hours. Water piled up Miles down the way and miles up this way. What a miracle. The power of God. But now look, as a believer, you have that same power. It's within us. And it's going to culminate in eternal life, in his presence for eternity. All right, now look at the other side of the coin. To us, Christ is the power of God. He's the miracle-working God. But he's also what the intellectual was looking for, and that was what? Wisdom. Wisdom. Now, turn to me to Second Peter. I wanted to get there all afternoon, and here's my opening. Here's my opening. Second Peter, chapter 3. Now, we've used these verses over and over because primarily I use them to confirm... Paul's authority as an apostle of the Gentiles, and that not just part of his writing, but every last word of it is Scripture. And we know from other portions of Scripture that Scripture is inspired of God. So when Paul says something like, my gospel, was that his idea? No. No. That's expressly what the Holy Spirit wanted him to say. All right, turn to 2 Peter 3, verse 15 and 16, honey. Verse 15. Now, this is Peter writing at the end of his life. He's probably martyred in a matter of weeks or days after he finishes this letter. And I think I mentioned in one of my recent programs, have you ever stopped to think? And I'm going to keep reminding people. I tell them on the phone over and over. Have you ever stopped to think that everything that needed to be done before the temple would be destroyed was accomplished within a year or two of the temple destruction? Just think about that. These little epistles at the end, I mean, uh, 2 Timothy and 2 Peter, were written just before Paul was martyred and just before Peter was martyred, which was probably in about 68 or 69 A.D. And when was the temple destroyed? 70 if you really think about that, everything was now in place for the removal of the temple and all the ramifications of the law and Judaism and what Israel lived for. But before it disappeared, everything was in place. Okay, now Peter writes again, probably just a year or two before the temple is destroyed, and look what he says, verse 15, a counter-understand that the long-suffering, the patience of our Lord is salvation. Well, that's what we've been talking about all afternoon. How that Paul is showing how that God wants all to be saved. He didn't just die for a few, he died for all. Okay, so his patience is salvation. I'll watch it. Even as our beloved brother Paul According to the what? This is what brought me here. What's the word? Wisdom. Not men's wisdom. 
not his rabbinical education, but those revelations from the ascended Lord and his inspired writings in his epistles, and then people scorn it, I feel for them. My, I'd hate to be in their shoes at the judgment seat. But here it is. Peter says, you go to our beloved brother Paul according to the wisdom given unto him. Well, from whom? From the ascended Lord. And as he hath written unto you. Now Peter is writing to Jews. And if he's referring to a letter that Paul had written to them, then that tells me Paul wrote Hebrews. Even though there are a lot of arguments otherwise. I say, hey, Scripture says Paul wrote it. Because there's no evidence of any other writing. So he must be referring to the book of Hebrews. All right? So he says, according to the wisdom given unto him, he has written unto you. Now look at verse 16. For you out there that may have someone of your friendship that detests Paul and think he shouldn't even be in our Bible, show them this verse. As also in all his epistles, that's Romans through Philemon, speaking in them of these things, salvation, as we've been seeing all afternoon, in which, that is Paul's epistles now, are some things hard to be understood, Peter had a hard time comprehending the grace of God for especially Gentile, which they who are unlearned and unstable twist. And I'm even going to say they go further than that. They reject it. All right? But they are unlearned and unstable. They twist as they do also the other scripture. Now, what does that tell you? that Paul's epistles are Scripture, just like all the rest of the Bible. Don't ever let anyone say it shouldn't even be in our Bible, because Peter says everything that Paul wrote is Scripture. And that's where I adamantly stand. All right? And so they twist Paul's epistles, even as they do also the other Scriptures, but when they do, What's their end result? It's to their own destruction. They better wake up before it's too late. Okay, let's come back to Corinthians again. I haven't gotten down to the one I wanted. I want to do that before we close. Okay, verse 24, the one we've just been commenting on. To them who are called, to the believers, 1 Corinthians 1, 24, both Jews and Greeks or Gentiles, Christ is the power of, of God, the miracle working power that all of Israel was constantly looking for. And he's also then the wisdom of God, that which even was poured out on the apostle himself. It all becomes part of us as we become a believer. Now verse 25, because the foolishness of God, so far as man is concerned, is wiser than men. The weakness of God is stronger than men. Then verse 26, For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not the high IQs of 200 plus, they're very rarely called, not many mighty, that's why you don't find royalty in the ministry very often, do you? Of course not. That's beneath them. So not many mighty, not many noble. They're not the kind that God calls. But here it comes now, but God. But God, who deals in areas totally different than humans do. And so, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. Do you see what that's saying? I don't have to comment on it. All I have to do is read it to you. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world, the things that the world ridicules. That's what God uses. 
And what does he use them for? To confound those who are ridiculing. <laughs> That's what it amounts to. Only God can do that. And then he goes on to say, and he's chosen the weak things. He doesn't use military might. He doesn't use political parties. He doesn't use great outpourings of, of earthly power. He uses the weak things. You know, even his 12 disciples, if you would like to go back to his earthly ministry, did he go into the temple and pick out 12 of the strongest and mightiest priests in the priesthood? No. He goes up to Galilee and chooses 12 common fishermen who probably barely had enough education to read. They didn't go through colleges in those days if they were fishermen. But see, that's where the Lord chose even the 12. In fact, Paul is probably the exception. He was an educated man, sat at the feet of Gamaliel, one of the chief rabbis of Israel. But all the rest of God's servants, common, ordinary people. And it was that that he uses then to confound the wise. All right, let's just read on. He just keeps multiplying this whole concept. He takes the base things of the world, the things that the world won't even give a second look, and the things which are despised. That's what God has chosen, yea, and things which are not, to bring to nothing the things that are. Oh, I know we don't see it that way. It doesn't look like Christianity is making any impact on the world, and we're not. But on the other hand, when a true believer enters into this, he knows what he's talking about. The true believer has an understanding of Scripture that the intellectualist world will never understand. All right, why has God chosen to do it in this particular way? The next verse gives the answer. That no flesh, that no individual should glory in God's presence. And so God uses the humble things of this world so that you and I can never exalt what we're doing before God. Never. We are just fortunate to be the clay in the Master's hands. And that's all we are. But don't ever forget, what can the Master do with the clay? <coughs>